All righty then. So, hello everybody. Okay. Uh, my name is John Fogarty. Uh, some of you would have met me before. Uh, no, I'm the head coach for uh, Team 1102 Making Magic. And today I'm going to be giving an overall presentation on some like beginning design concepts and principles and things you would want to know to design a robot for the first robotics competition. Uh, I'm an alumni of the first program. I'm probably one of the lucky few that when FTC first started, got to go through the entire progression of first, essentially. I started out in FLL in middle school back in 2006, and I uh, got to participate in FTC team for pretty much my entire high school career, alongside being on the 1102 FRC team. So I'm actually the coach of the team that I was on when I was a student. Uh, it's just funny how things work out sometimes. Um, and so without any further ado, I'm just going to get started. Um, and let's move right on. So I'm just going to give you some things to think about. Uh, what do you need to consider whenever you're first starting out with your robot design? Um, the first the most important question to ask yourself is when do you want to have your robot finished by? Um, this, this question was a lot easier to answer before when you had more of a definitive um, uh, end date to when you ha your robot had to be done. Um, Everybody who was competing in FRC prior to the last few years knows that we only had six weeks to build the robot before, but now your build season's a lot longer. Um, but you need to have your robot done well in advance of your first competition. How long is it going to take you to make any parts if you need to fabricate them? How long is it going to take you to put them together? If you've never built a robot before, these things do take time. and. A lot of the time, unless you're building something that's a kit, there are no instructions. So you're going to have to figure out how things bolt together, and it's not always the most straightforward process. And then third most important to think about is how much time are you going to give your drive team practice? Okay? As this is a competition that's not just an automated robot. Um, it's also something that your kids have to learn how to drive, your students have to learn how to drive. Uh, and the, the team needs to be able to program the robots so that the uh, team can practice. Um, then, of course, you got to consider your resources, your your tools, and your funding. Uh, and then, what experience do you have? Um, some teams have more experienced mentors to draw from. Some teams have been around for longer, so they have students that gained experience from competitions. What can you do to gain experience if you don't have any on your team right now? There are places you can go online uh, to get knowledge uh, from other people without them having to physically be there with you, be that YouTube. Uh, there's a great uh, online community called Chief Delphi where there are mentors from teams all over the world. Um, and then there's just all these different kinds of websites, essentially, uh, from blogs to um, team websites where they post their builds to different resources that you can look up to get more experience than you would typically have first starting out. So here's a couple of key principles to keep in mind um, whenever you're first starting out with your robot. You want to keep your robot simple, and I'm going to get into it what, a little bit about more about what I mean by simple in just a minute. You want to design your robot so that it's easy to take apart, and there's a reason for that in that when it breaks, you don't want to spend half the day trying to disassemble it so that you can fix it. You want to be able to fix it, take it apart in minutes at most, because if you get into the playoff round at a competition, you really have absolutely no time whatsoever to take something apart and fix it. So you have to design for it to be taken apart from the beginning. Um, if you can, design parts that can do more than one thing. That's what multifunctionality is. Uh, and then there's some uh, different other things to keep in mind, uh, some mechanical and electrical theory parts. We'll discuss that in just a minute. Uh, and then design of a robot is an iterative process. You don't just start with a blank piece of paper, or come up with a full concept, make it, and you're done. That's not how building a robot works. Um, you really take what you start out with, and you keep changing it over time. You keep uh, iterating upon it. Uh, trying to make it better as uh, time goes on. Don't just stop with your first um, failure or success. Keep trying to push it further. And then wait, I'll discuss why wait's important if you didn't know that already. So, of course, 
Simplicity is a key consideration for keeping things durable. Um, quote I've heard from, I actually don't know who uh, was the first person that ever said this, but come up with a complex solution to a complex problem is pretty hard, but to come up with a simple solution to a complex problem is even harder. And um, it, once you get into the meat of designing and building first robots or any kind of design work uh, in the real world engineering space, you'll learn that this is a very true statement. Um, there are a lot of complex solutions to problems, but the simpler ones are the ones you want to try to strive for. So what do I mean when I say design for disassembly? You got to think about things like access holes. If you've got fasteners hidden behind underneath panels and whatnot, you need to be able to make sure that you can somehow have a hole through that panel so that you can easily take your T-handle or your screwdriver or your socket wrench or whatever it may be so that you can unbolt those fasteners. You want to stick to using a standard set of fasteners. Um, what I mean by that is don't mix metric and SAE bolts together if you can help it. Um, try to keep everything easy and standardized. Um, if you want to know what my team uses, um, because we're heavily ingrained into the VEX um, Pro ecosystem, almost every fastener on our robot is 832, uh, any length, nut size, and then um, we use rivets. I believe we're using uh, 5 16 rivets if we use rivets. Um, it, it depends on the use case if we're using rivets. Uh, and then thinking about gluing or welding things together, um, there are use cases where welding is a great idea, but, uh, and I've seen a lot of teams with successful uses of welding, but um, my team has never used welding once, except for like in a really odd case. Um, so don't, don't just think welding is the right answer. Uh, take, take a moment to think about how you can make something work without that first. And then of course, the entire reason for designing for disassembly is think about how hard it is to fix, how hard is it gonna to be to fix something if it goes wrong? That's the entire reason behind designing things with the thought process of making sure you can take them back apart easily again. Multifunctionality. So if you have a subsystem on your robot that you can use to do more than one thing, that's honestly a really excellent feature to have. Um, there are teams that um, in previous games, uh, we had to pick up game pieces off the field and place them into goals to call pick and place games. Those systems were like elevators, um, linear motion uh, devices that allowed them to pick those devices up off the ground and then lift them high up into the air. Um, and some teams were creative in that way and that they used those same systems they used for manipulating those game pieces and picking them up in the air and putting them down to help lift their robot up at the end of the game. There are certain challenges that that um, comes up year after year and this coming year is gonna be no exception to that. Um, Multifunctionality allows you to save weight and complexity. It, it can make your robot overall simpler if you can design them properly. Um, just a couple of examples, just like picking up a ball and hanging from the bar like I just mentioned, or um, using a rod as both a pivot and a structural member of your robot. You can get a whole lot of rigidity out of things like that if you uh, think about it as you go. And now here's the, here's the great news flash for those of you who have never thought of it, but you really do need to do the math. Um, Designing a robot without doing the math can make you look silly. Uh, and I can assure you that I've made this mistake before many times when I was younger. Um, we built a thousand to one gearbox for an arm once and thought this is gonna work great. It's got plenty of torque and power. Yeah, we shattered the gearbox after turning it on one time because of the fact we never thought can the gears handle the load that we're putting on them by the motor that we're and the torque that the motor provides to those gears. Yeah, it was it was a really sad time for everybody involved. Um, there are some great tools out there that can help you figure these sorts of things out. Um, how much load can a gearbox handle? How much uh, torque do you need to be able to move an arm of a certain weight and length? Um, uh, what's the linear speed of a uh, intake? What's the rotational speed of an arm? What's the rotational speed of like a shooter? 
all these different things. If you don't have someone on your team that's like an expert in physics or engineering, there are kind of guides out there to help you learn the basic principles behind it. And uh, a tool that I love, I was introduced to actually when I was in college, the JVN calculator. Um, John V. Noon, he's a coach and uh, engineer at the VEX Robotics Company. Um, he had, uh, that's his website and blog right there uh, that I linked. He provides a calculator that helps with calculating all sorts of things from drivetrains to manipulators and arms to any basic system that you want to design. He has a tool that will give you a rough idea of is the component that you're using and the gears you're using good for that purpose. There's a lot of things you've got to consider. And if you don't know something, definitely get help to at and ask and learn about it before you just assume that your design is going to work mathematically. Because um, truthfully, you can figure it out through trial and error, um, but you'll save yourself a lot of money and time, which again, big resources you have very limited amount of. You'll save yourself money and time if you validate your ideas with math first. <clears throat> Iteration. I mentioned this before. Um, you want to constantly rework your old ideas. Um, don't just leave them alone and <laughs> assume that they're the most efficient version of what you're trying to accomplish. It's often good to just throw designs out and then redo them again from the beginning. And every time you start over from the beginning, you'll probably understand the process a little bit better. <clears throat> Big thing to keep in mind with FRC is that um, we have to build within certain limits, whether they be size, weight, or power. First is a weight limit. Um, it's typically between 120 to 130, 125, 130 pounds. It varies uh, year to year. Um, they've changed it a bit. And it's extremely easy to exceed the weight limit if you're not paying attention, uh, depending on what component you're using. If you're using steel at all, You'll, you'll be amazed how fast steel will make your robot very heavy very quickly. And I've seen some steel robots in my day um, on the field before. So um, consider using lighter weight components. Consider your fasteners and uh, try not to just take the cheese hole method and drill thousands of holes in your robot. Because I don't know if um, you realize how many holes you would have to drill in most cases to actually be able to reduce weight a significant amount. So definitely consider that weight is a key factor as you design your robot. And there are materials that will help you make it easier for yourself. Plastics like Lexan, uh, polycarbonate, very strong and very rigid, and you can use those as structural components or even better, just components to make up plates and such that are actually better in some cases than an aluminum would be, where an aluminum would uh, deform and never spring back to its original shape, whereas a plastic like Lexan, if it got hit by another robot in a contact uh, situation, it would just flex out of the way and then go straight back to where it was uh, after you uh, the contact had been avoided. Uh, wood is actually a very valid um, construction material. Um, as you compete in first, you will come across several good teams that use wood. Um, wood is definitely not uh, something you should overlook if you are tight on resources or just have the right tools to work with wood or mentors that know how to work with wood. Um, wood is definitely a really powerful um, uh, building material to consider. Not only weight, but I said power, okay? The FRC battery can only supply so much energy at one time. Um, without getting into the specifics of how much power and amperage you can get out of it, um, just understand that um, your power capacity for how much you can draw at one time is limited, and it is extremely limited. We are using uh, lead-acid batteries, which are not known for their extremely high output. Uh, they're just very safe, and that's the reason that we use them in first. Um, the power distribution panel can only support 16 motors maximum, and you may think, wow, that's a lot of motors. Uh, I'll tell you right now, the robot that my team built for the 2019-2020 game, it, it used every single power distribution panel out. So you can run up your motor limit real quick if you're not careful. 
Uh, you only have eight high power slots and then you have eight lower lower power slots. So again, the type of motor is that you want to use, you're going to be limited as to which ones uh, you can use for an application based on how many slots you've filled up. And we'll get into like what a high power versus low power application is in just a little bit. Um, that calculator I mentioned earlier, the JVN calculator, it can help you calculate the power draw of your motors under load. It actually will give you current um, um, theoretical usage amounts uh, for a given weight uh, or load application, and uh, it'll help you figure out, okay, well, the drivetrain on my robot is going to be drawing about this much power, and my manipulator on my robot is going to be drawing this much power. I still have this much overhead left over to do something else with, or I'm going to be browning out is what it would be called a part of my robot whenever I use a different part. So you have to think about keeping your robot's efficiencies up with each certain component of the robot. Um, because if you're using too much power on one subsystem, you'll cause your drivetrain to drive a lot slower. I mean, things like this are just, you have to think about it and um, or else you'll run into some issues later on. So the overall design process, just from a high level, is you start out with your brainstorming process, then you get into your prototyping and design validation. It's where you really figure out if the things you drew on paper or on a whiteboard actually work in the real world. And then once you move on from that, you get into the testing and polishing phases where you actually try to take those things and make them more efficient or make them work a little bit better. Uh, and then you just repeat those top three steps over and over again until you get a robot that's serviceable for competition usage. Um, in the brainstorming process, I really, really want to make this clear that there is no completely insane idea, actually. I mean, unless you're talking about using a nuclear reactor on your robot, just consider every possible idea um, because some of the most wacky ideas actually are grounded in a piece of reality. Um, and sometimes the most insane ideas are actually really, really good ones. Um, we had a case of that a couple of years ago. On, we'd never thought to use a vacuum as a manipulator in a robot before on our team, and uh, a vacuum actually ended up being really, honestly, a great solution. And um, I've even seen in a, a game a year later, a vacuum was successfully used to get a team all the way to the Einstein field at the world championship level. So you can't just throw out an idea because of the fact that it's not common. Um, so definitely keep that in mind during the brainstorming process and test and verify that the idea isn't valid or not. Uh, definitely make yourself mock-ups of your playing field. If you have the space, build a practice field as close to spec as you can within reason, monetarily speaking, so that you'll be able to test your ideas within the full extent possible before you get to competition. Um, and then, of course, during the prototyping process, you've got to prove that your concepts work. You can test out different motors. You can test out your different uh, actuators like pistons or cylinders, uh, ver validate the geometry, change it up a little bit, uh, things like that. Uh, and just try everything you possibly can uh, during the prototyping phase to make sure that you have something that actually really does work well. Make sure that you take that prototype and then you actually refine it more than just, okay, if this works now, we're done. Let's ship it, okay? You definitely want to try and enhance your uh, design further before you reach the competition stage. And prototyping needs to happen fairly rapidly. Um, so plan ahead before build season starts. Make sure you have some materials on hand to prototype the first week of comp uh, build season. Uh, you don't want to be starting your prototyping the third or fourth week. You want to be prototyping the first two days of build season. You want to get things really rapidly moving so that you can uh, verify your ideas and concepts. So now what I'm going to get into is a bit more of uh, conventional design. Um, I'm going to give you some examples and some things to think about. And uh, some of these are going to be very applicable to the challenge that we're going to have this coming year. And some are uh, less applicable, but um, they're all just things that if you've never built a robot before, it's definitely useful for you to know and uh, to see. And uh, so let's get right started with that. So, the core of a robot is its drive system usually, okay? Our uh, robots need to be able to move around a 27 by 54 foot 
field. It is typically covered in carpet, though it has, in some cases, not been carpet. Um, and it needs to be able to drive around, push objects, pull objects, and other robots. Um, in some games, there is contact with other teams and robots, and the other games, there isn't. But you're never on the field by yourself. Sometimes you have to be able to climb up ramps or go over obstacles, and these are just other things to keep in mind. It is usually by far um, the most important subsystem. And by that, I mean that in competition, if your drivetrain isn't working, you're not going to be scoring points usually. I've never seen a case where that isn't the, the truth. And honestly, teams make decisions on who to play with in playoffs sometimes based off how well your drivetrain works. Um, drivetrain systems are very, very important. Um, the rules that I like to live by are they've got to be durable, reliable, and they have to be um, able to move quickly and have some good, strong pushing force in certain situations. And of course, as common sense would dictate, you never want your drive system to fail ever, ever. Okay. <clears throat> So here are some examples of uh, different types of drive systems, and this is the most common type, tank drive. Um, it has two sets of wheels on the left and right side, um, and there are multiple wheels on each side. I'll give you a, a picture example in just a second. And they're usually powered by two gearboxes, one on each side, left and right. Um, they usually use your highest uh, powered motors that have the largest thermal mass, and by that I mean you don't want these motors to heat up uh, some of our smaller motors are very powerful in terms of wattage power output. However, they have very small thermal mass. And the reason you wouldn't want to use a high power but low thermal mass motor in this application is that if, say, you ever stalled it out by running into another robot uh, in a pushing match, those motors with the lower thermal mass would quite literally set themselves on fire and burn out within seconds of being uh, hit with a higher load. Whereas these higher thermal mass, higher powered motors, the SIM, the Mini SIM, the Falcon and the Neo, these motors can handle a lot longer sustained loads. And because they're larger, they can dissipate that heat more efficiently. Uh, and these are the kinds of motors that are most ideal for the application. So the SIM and the Mini SIM are uh, what I would call simple motors. They're uh, red and black, a positive and negative only uh, simple motors. They're called brush motors. You can look up a little bit more about that online. Uh, and then the other motors are what you would consider your smart motors. This is called the Falcon 500 and the Rev Neo. These are brushless motors. They have integrated sensors inside of them that allow you to do a lot of cool different things without having to buy uh, an external sensor kit. And these are very new. Uh, they've only come out in the last three or four years. Uh, but they're showing to be uh, really highly efficient and popular options on uh, drive systems. And in some cases, they actually clean up your wiring a bit too um, because you don't need external controllers, motor controllers, like you do on the SIM and the mini SIMs. Um, so these are generally your options. And as you can see, I put in bold <laughs> case there. You never want to use less than four motors on your drivetrain ever. I never, ever, ever use less than four. Uh, if you use two, you're going to run into problems. Um, I've seen that mistake before. Please never use less than four motors on your drivetrain. Um, usually when your robot gets to about 100 pounds, um, if you are not using four motors, your robot won't have enough power to efficiently move itself around, let alone if it ever came into contact with another robot. Things you want to do is you want to keep your robot simple or drivetrain simple, and the tank drive is very much a simple drivetrain. Uh, it's easy to design, it's easy to build, and uh, it's easy to program. And it has the potential for high speed and pushing force. Okay? The only weakness a, a um, tank drive has is it does have slightly less agility in certain very specific situations than others. And, uh, I'll give you an example of a drivetrain that's uh, slightly better in that way in just a little bit. Here are some examples of the most typical um, tank drive setups you have. Um, it's called tank drive, but um, another uh, name for it is um, center drop wheeled skid drive or um, skid steer drive. Essentially, the picture here on the right um, is your Andy Mark kit of parts chassis. So if this is your first year uh, in FRC, this is the kit of parts 
uh, drivetrain you will get. Uh, it comes with uh, some very easy and simple to use uh, instructions to put it together. Um, those white wheels that come with it are very grippy. They're very, very strong uh, candidates to keep on the robot all year round. You don't really have to replace them unless you're driving it like you stole it. <laughs> uh, they're very, very robust um, and very easy to put together. And the reason that it's called a center drop, by the way, is that the center wheel is slightly lower than the outer two wheels, and that's just to help you have a shorter, effective wheelbase um, so that it's easier to turn your robot. Um, the best example I've ever given is to someone who doesn't really understand what I mean is if you've gone to Lowe's before and you've ever um, used one of those like uh, lumber carts uh, to push things around, you'll notice those th lumber carts are fairly long and they kind of teeter totter a little bit. Those lumber carts are center drop uh, drive as or wheeled as well. They they make it easier for you to turn as you're uh, maneuvering around the store. And then the sh the drivetrain you see there on the um, on the left side of the screen, uh, that's something called um, West Coast Drive. It was popularized. Uh, I don't know if the Cheesy Poops were the first to do it by a team out in California, um, but uh, it's a slightly different drive system in that the wheels are cantilevered. You see they don't have an outer plate um, supporting them, and that's honestly not a terrible way to go. Um, you'll see that the Andy Mark drivetrain, the wheels are not cantilevered. It's just a different take on the same kind of drive system. Um, they're built slightly differently. They use um, essentially the same gearbox components and it, there's no real huge difference between them. It's just that the structure that you use to build one versus the other, the Andymark frame is using sheet metal, the uh, West Coast drive frame is using aluminum tubing extrusions. Um, my team in particular finds the aluminum tubing extrusion easy to build with. So we've been building robots with that drivetrain now for the past three years and we love it a lot. So in the future, if your team wanted to upgrade to a different type of drive system, that's one to consider. Here's some other tank drive examples. And these are the more like when you think of a tank, this is what you think of, right? Tank treads. Um, the picture there on your left uh, is a uh, drive system kit of sold by Andy Mark called uh, the Rhino Track Drive System. It's not the only option for a kit um, track drive system, but it's probably the easiest to get a hold of and it has instructions on how to put, a, put together. So it is by far the most beginner friendly one. Uh, and then just as a aside, the picture there you see on your right is what a custom track drive system might look like. Um, that's that's a 10 year old picture right there. You can see the guy there in the picture. That's me there with my sister whenever I was a sophomore in high school. Um, we built that track drive system using plates of small ABS plastic and uh, Kevlar belting stretched around uh, idler pulleys. And that was a very challenging robot to build, but it was very, very exciting to learn how that process worked uh, to build something like that. So, I mean, and we did fairly well competitively with it too. So it was it was very fun to build. Um, I believe a game that year was like a soccer style game. So there was a lot of contact. You had to play goalie essentially. And that's what the role of our robot was, was to play goalie with that track drive so that no one could get around us uh, on the field. So um, track drives are valuable in certain very specific situations where you really need to be stout and expect to have high contact with other opposing teams. But um, it's not necessary. You can essentially get the exact same performance out of a wheeled drivetrain. So track drive is kind of pushing the limits of what you really need in terms of uh, competitive advantage. Um, next, you have holonomic drive. There are a lot of different kinds of holonomic drive. Essentially, what a holonomic drive is that it allows your robot to move and not only in the forward, backward, and rotation directions, but allows your robot to strafe left and right as uh, additionally, so um, there's a lot of different kinds. You've got mechanum drive as an option. Uh, I'll show you what that is if you've never seen one before in just a minute. H drive, X drive, Kiwi drive. Essentially, every wheel on a holonomic drive train has to be driven independently or it will not work. Um, they are agile. They can move in almost any direction. However, they do have weaknesses, okay? They have almost no potential for pushing force. Um, I've never really seen a holonomic drivetrain um, 
ever push another robot or be much of a nuisance uh, other than one type, which that's kind of an exception. I'll show you what that is in a moment. And uh, they usually require a lot more complexity in the number of gearboxes and uh, components you have to put together to make them work as well. Here are a couple examples. Over here on the left-hand side, you see this kind of triangular uh, drive base. That's what's a referred to as a Kiwi drive. Um, it's a three-wheel drive train. Um, it's kind of interesting and it's very uncommon. You don't really run into those very often. Three motor, three gearbox drivetrain. Um, and it allows you to move, like I said, in any direction, forward, back, rotation, sideways. All these drivetrains essentially move in almost a similar kind of way. Up in the top right corner with the green on it, uh, that's the, uh, that's more of a typical holonomic X drive. Um, it's just a VEX version. I've honestly never seen an FRC version of that drivetrain, but it is a drivetrain style that does exist. Uh, each corner wheel, just like on the Kiwi drive system, are omni wheels. Um, basically, they're wheels with uh, completely horizontal rollers staggered uh, every uh, half an inch or so. And because of those little rollers staggered like that, you're allowed to slide the robot around as you turn the motors counterclockwise to one another in different orientations to allow it to um, drive in whichever direction you would like. Down there in the bottom right is the Mechanum drive. Um, that is a, I don't know how old that drive system is. Uh, the only places you really ever see them in the real world is uh, in factories. You'll see there are uh, occasions where uh, forklifts use them to help them move around to manipulate pallets and whatnot easier. Um, but these wheels are very interesting in that they don't have quite as uh, much of an issue um, with traction as a typical uh, omni wheel drive system does, but they still have less traction than a standard wheel. Um, but what they do is they allow you to vector uh, your uh, motion power from your uh, gearboxes to allow you to move sideways. Um, so you can spin the wheels, drive them forward and backward, and turn left and right like a standard uh, tank drive would. But then if you turn the wheels towards each other, you essentially create a virtual screw. If you can imagine how a screw moves uh, in your mind. Essentially, that is what you're doing when you turn a mechanic wheel towards each other or away from each other. You're creating a, a virtual screw, essentially. And that allows the robot to slide sideways left to right as well. Uh, these wheels also do allow you to slide diagonally a little bit, but it's a little more complex to control them that way. And then you have the last and most complex drive system that I really wanted to highlight, and that's Swerve Drive. Um, you really don't see these very often, but they're starting to become a little bit more popular. They're definitely not something a rookie team should attempt. Uh, it, it's something you should learn about and play around with. Uh, in the future, and maybe you can come to understand them better because they're a great learning tool and you learn a whole lot about programming and design whenever you play with them. So I definitely recommend just learning about them and maybe playing with them in your off seasons. Um, but they allow you to control the motion of the robot almost to the point where you're basically creating a, a robot that can drive like a video game character. It can move in almost any direction, rotate while translating, so move forward and spin at the same time. Um, they're basically the unicorns of drive systems. They let you do whatever you really want to do. Um, they require four wheels typically, and this is the, one of the biggest reasons why they're the most complex. I've never seen a swerve drive system that uses less than eight motors. I'm pretty positive it's not possible to do without eight motors unless you're kind of doing some kind of caster drive with idler wheels. Um, and they require the most uh, work in terms of sensors and programming. Uh, they're very, they can be very high speed and they can also, uh, in some cases, have high pushing force as well. But they're very complicated and they take up a lot of your motors. If you're using eight of your motors on your drivetrain, you have to be very creative with how to use your motors for the rest of your components on your robot. Here's a couple of different examples of what a swerve um, drivetrain looks like. Um, the one up in the top right actually is a kit you can buy from a Swerve Drive specialties company. Uh, it's a really, really, really robust kit um, that's put together. 
Uh, if you were just starting out and wanted to experiment with it, it's one of the options you can uh, take a look at. Uh, unfortunately, the GIFs don't work. The picture down at the bottom uh, was one I wanted to show you of just like what a drivetrain looks like moving. Uh, if you go on YouTube and look up uh, 1717 FRC, uh, there was a video of a team from 2012 uh, with their robot driving around in, in swerve configuration. It's very cool. Um, we won't focus too much on that anymore now. But to start out with, the kit of parts drivetrain uses either six or eight inch or six or four inch Andy Mark wheels. And the best configurations for them are the four SIM, four Neo, or four Falcon motors. Mm -hmm. And they're usually the most cost to complexity efficient option for you to use. Um, so if this is your first year or first time building a robot, it's definitely a great option to start out with. Moving on from the drivetrain, we're going to get into end effectors and manipulators. These are the things that you actually need to be able to uh, do most of the tasks to play any given game, uh, whether it's a game where you're picking up balls or discs, uh, boxes, or any other object. You need to be able to usually manipulate a game piece in some kind of way, whether it's putting it in a goal or pushing it up a ramp or stacking them on top of each other. There's a lot of things you uh, end up needing to do year after year uh, in different competitions to be able to succeed in scoring points. So the first thing we're going to talk about is an intaking system. Uh, an intake system uh, is how you initially take control of a game piece off the field. Uh, common examples of those are rollers or uh, softer wheels, uh, maybe even belts uh, and <laughs> pinchers, like your fingers pinch to pick up like a pencil or a piece of paper off of. Um, and they use smaller motors usually. Um, there's a lot of different options for manipulate intake systems in terms of motors. So um, there's no one right answer for this. It really depends on your use case and how uh, you need it to work and the sizing and packaging you need. But one really important aspect that I want you to understand from this presentation is this. If you're using a roller style intake or a wheeled style intake, belt, whatever, uh, active roller intakes need to be several times faster than the speed of your drive chain when you're moving across the field. If you power your motor or your roller system by a, a slower factor than that of which your drive chain is moving, you're going to run into issues where you're just going to be driving straight over game pieces. Um, I've seen this several times at competitions, and it's just a common uh, miss item on the design process. Make sure that you're Rollers are definitely spinning several times faster than the most that you typically drive your robot around. Um, and the dimensions of this system are super important. So you, you definitely start usually with your intake and then design up from there, coming up with the like full package of your robot. You want to keep by the mantra that I've listed here in the heading, though. If you want to touch that game piece, you want to own it immediately. You do not want to take several seconds of your two-minute match to just gain control of a game piece, unless, of course, we're talking about a game where controlling the game piece is all there is. Um, there have been those in the past. But um, make sure that you own the game piece as quickly as possible so that you can move on to whatever you need to do to score it. Here's just a couple of picture examples of what I mean by roller intakes. You've got some wheeled ones here on the left-hand side with motors directly driving them through planetary gearboxes. There are a lot of different companies that make things called planetary gearboxes. The ones that supply first directly are AndyMark, Vex, uh, Rev Robotics. These companies provide very easy turnkey with instruction kind of uh, solutions to help you power uh, shafts to wheels and rollers very easily uh, without um, too much guesswork. Uh, the picture there on the right is just a CAD rendering of uh, a roller style intake. You've got two um, PVC tubes or um, metal tubes with um, hex hubs inserted into the end of them, or they don't have to be hex hubs. They can just be fixed uh, hubs that you make out of um, PVC capped off with uh, bolts or shafts running through them. Uh, and they can be free rolling or uh, driven, and they pull in game pieces by rotating around 
uh, with some kind of higher friction material on them. In some cases, you don't need a higher friction material. It really depends on what the game piece is. Uh, but these are just some examples so that you get a picture in your mind of what I'm referring to. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk a little bit about shooters. Um, this is a hint. Things I'm going in order here might, might be valuable to you. Um, shooters need to have uh, a lot of, uh, are probably one of the more complex systems to design in terms of an FRC like game manipulator. Uh, they have a lot of variables to think about. And if it's your first time ever making a shooter, make sure to keep it as simple as you possibly can to start out with. Make sure your shooters are rigid. Um, and the, the loading from your collector or your feeder is very consistent. Um, I've seen shooters that are very well constructed, but because of the feeding system into them is poorly designed, the shooter design is performs poorly. Uh, you want to make sure you got some consistent loading into that shooter. You want to make sure that you can control it with programming to operate at a consistent speed. You want it to make sure that it doesn't uh, wear down too quickly and it's easy to maintain. And you want to make sure that the way it behaves on game pieces is as consistent as possible. Sometimes it's not possible because the game pieces are the most inconsistent thing in the world. However, if you can, make sure that the way your robot behaves for the game piece is fairly consistent. If you were able to make it dynamically adjustable to the individual game pieces, if they were so weirdly out of flex, that's amazing, but typically our game pieces aren't that weird that you need to do that. Um, things that you're going to have to iterate when designing a shooter are things like compression, angle, um, speed of the flywheels, if you're using a flywheel type shooter, that is. Um, and you only want to adjust one thing at a time. Um, adjusting multiple variables at once is very unscientific. You'll run into some weird problems if you do more than one thing at a time. Definitely adjust one thing at a time and uh, try to uh, dial it in that way. It'll make your life a lot easier. And take advantage of your technology that you have. Um, everybody's mid to high-end cell phones these days usually have a high-speed video capture mode. Take videos of your shooter as you're uh, testing it. It'll allow you to see if there's anything that's not happening consistently as a ball or a game piece travels through it to allow you to identify problems easier. <clears throat> uh, shooters need to have highly efficient motors for spinning at high speeds for a long period of time. Uh, these are the motors that I would personally recommend, Falcon 500s, Revlines, uh, or 775 Pros, depending on who you get them from, or the Neo motor. Um, these motors are highly efficient at uh, high speed and they don't require, well, the red line and the Falcon, I'm sorry, the Falcon and the Neo do not require much gearing to make them perfect for a shooter application. The red line does need um, some gearing down. It spins way faster. Um, the Falcons spin at about five to 6,000 RPM, whereas the red line spin at about 18,000 RPM. And you do not need 18,000 RPM for a shooter. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't have any torque to move the game piece at that speed anyway. You could have to gear it down a little bit. Um, you need a sensor. Uh, typically, uh, in almost every part of your robot, you should be using sensors to their utmost. Uh, but you need a sensor to be able to read your flywheel speed in this particular case, such that you'll be able to control it accurately. Your programmers are going to need to learn about things like PID, velocity control, and feed forward control to be able to take the most advantage of um, shooting balls accurately or game pieces accurately in a given situation. Here's a couple of examples of what a wheeled shooter looks like. Um, the variations are endless almost. You've got dual wheeled shooters like the one on the far right. I'm sorry, the far left. Single side uh, inline shooters in the center here. Then uh, you've got hooded shooters like the one up in the top right. Um, same thing in the middle and bottom. Those are uh, called fixed angle or variable angle hooded shooters. You have a single flywheel on one side and then an arc of either wood, plastic, or any other kind of material on the back side. And the compression between the wheels and that back fixed piece of material is what allows the game piece to pick up energy from the flywheel to then fly at a certain trajectory uh, towards the goal. There's a lot of different 
variations and uh, possibilities for a shooter. These are just some of the more common ones that I've seen uh, throughout the years. The reason why a shooter is so complicated is because of all of the most mathematical principles that are involved with them. You've got velocity of the shot, you've got launch angle, whether it's vertical or horizontal. You got the spin of whatever it is you're shooting to consider and how that affects its trajectory. And does your team need to be able to adjust those um, elements of the shooter itself during the match? I can tell you, you do not need to make your shooter infinitely variable to be successful. You can make a very fixed angle position shooter that the only thing you're varying is the speed of the flywheel and in a wheeled shooter's case. Um, and you can vary the shot quite a significant amount to shoot at different distances. So you, you can actually simplify your life a lot by doing things like that. Um, make it as easy as possible for your drivers uh, and for your programmers who are making autonomous programs to be able to make it so that it's not guesswork as to where they need to be to make the point scorable. Um, so these are just things you've got to think about when you're designing a shooter. Um, there are a lot of variability when it comes to shooter components. Um, the wheels are one of the most important parts when it's a wheeled shooter. Um, the diameter of the wheels, I've seen so many different ways of going about a wheeled shooter, whether it's higher, uh, higher size, a larger size wheels. Um, the durometer of the wheel, which is, I guess, the easiest way to describe it is how compliant the wheel is, how squishy it is, or hard the wheel is how much it wears down over time, uh, how much they cost. Um, sometimes in previous years, I've even seen uh, non just like hard wheels, you can uh, use um, pneumatic wheels as well. Though I think those aren't probably the best to use in this application typically. Uh, other things you can do, cutting grooves into the wheels maybe, paint uh, on like urethane plastic, um, Different, lot, there's so many different options to make your wheels perform slightly differently. This is why the shooter is probably the most complex design element of a robot. You could spend an entire build season working on how to optimize a shooter. shooter. I guarantee you that much. <laughs> so uh, it is very interesting uh, to work on. And uh, here's a hint, this coming year's game has a shooting challenge. So <laughs> if you didn't already know that, now you know. Um, so. Take take these uh, considerations to heart. Uh, and then just as an aside, another example of a shooter, I've personally never built one. Um, my team has before I was on it, but um, linear punch shooters. So these are taking things like spring force and uh, applying it in a linear fashion to be able to kick game pieces. Uh, and then you also have things like a catapult um, or a trebuchet, essentially. You're building a smaller version of that. Um, these are other options for launching game pieces if you needed to throw them up into the air. These are supposed to be gifts, but unfortunately they don't work, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but if you wanted to look up some examples, uh, this is a team right here that if you've never heard of before, you definitely should check out their YouTube channel. It's Team 118, the Robonauts. They probably have some of the best produced videos of all time of any FRC team. Uh, they work out of the Houston Johnson Space Center, um, and they're uh, a wonderful team of people that are great. If you'll ever meet them in a competition, they'll spend plenty of time teaching you anything you want to know. Anything you want to know about their robot. All of their students on our team are extremely intelligent. It's it's actually insane. So um, definitely check out their videos if you've never seen them before. Next, arms and elevators. These allow you to lift your robot or game pieces up into the air. Uh, they're typically attached to a, sh a shaft at one end with a large sprocket and hub, uh, at least in the case of an arm um, or an elevator in a different case. I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, uses either like chains or uh, I guess rope, uh, any kind of uh, chains or rope in most cases to be able to move uh, carriages up and down in a linear fashion. Uh, you definitely have to use. Um, encoders or potentiometers to be able to accurately track the position of an arm or an elevator to be successful. Um, if you can't utilize a sensor like that, you're gonna have a much harder time controlling it and your drivers are not going to be your friend. <laughs> um, 
There are other um, components you can use to make arms and elevators easy to use. Um, pneumatic cylinders are an option for linear motion as well. Um, they use air pressure to make uh, a cylinder extend or retract in some cases. These are just things that you can learn how to use. Uh, here's an example of what I meant when I said an, a single, single jointed arm uh, with a large sprocket or gear at the top. Um, it's a single axis up and down. Um, these are just very simple, easy to understand examples. You typically have a, a motor with a small sprocket geared or chained to a one large sprocket, and that gives you a lot of power to be able to lift up the arm in a very controlled and relatively, uh, I wouldn't say slow, you can make a, a high geared arm pretty quick, but um, you wanna make it so that it's easy to control. You don't wanna um, have an uncontrollable amount of speed when it comes to building an arm. And then you have multi-jointed uh, arms. These are significantly more complex. Um, I've only built one, honestly, before, and I don't think it was in an FRC competition. Um, these are uh, taking advantage of things called four bar or six bar linkages um, or uh, other variations on that, actually. Um, and what they allow you to do is they allow you to uh, collapse your system into a very small space and expand into a very large space. Um, they're not the only option when it comes to that kind of behavior that you want, but they're just an option to consider. Um, there are lots of research and design videos online about how a multi-bar system like this works. So if you're interested in learning more, definitely check it out. Uh, and then another example is an elevator. Um, elevators, I believe, are probably one of the more simple machines to learn how to make. You just are, you're building a large pulley system using either twine rope um, line or a chain. Uh, and there are usually two different ways to set them up. Um, you have the continuous system where you've got one long wrapping back and forth uh, chain of rope that allows you to uh, pull up all of the stages of your elevator at one time. Whereas um, in a cascade system, you're essentially lifting one stage of the system at a time. They each have their benefits, um, and I've built both uh, it, for different reasons. Uh, they don't just allow you to lift up game pieces. You can use elevators like this in a collapsed uh, fashion to be able to lift your entire robot as well. So they work not only for lifting up game pieces, but you can use them kind of in a reverse fashion and pull things up with them as well. Um, so. Again, it's just like any elevator you ride in in a building. Um, they, they have a lot of variability and capability into what they're uh, able to do. Uh, you typically run spools of rope or, or you run sprockets and chain and series up a uh, cascade system, either using things like linear rails or um, pieces of tube with bearings. There are kits online, uh, almost every FRC um, supplier sells an elevator kit or a design that you can learn from that uses bearings for linear motion or um, rails. Um, the picture you actually see here on the left is the robot uh, my students built in 2000, is it 2018, I believe. Um, and we actually used a fairly like robust set of drawer slides to make that elevator system you see there. And that was a that was an award winning robot. We were able to build a successful elevator using drawer slides <laughs> to compete in a competition. So uh, you don't have to go really crazy in terms of building a custom fabricated elevator. You can keep things quite simple and uh, be successful. You will reach the limits at some point with how you can use some of those components, but um, they do work in some cases. Um, advice for arms. Um, we talked about a little bit about weight or before. Um, using thinner wall materials in certain cases can help you reduce weight. Um, think about uh, how those materials will act under load. Uh, you don't want them to um, bend too much or flex too much because it'll make it a lot harder to control. Uh, every pivot point on your robot needs to be carefully thought about and uh, you have to do the math on how each pivot point is going to act. Um, and linkages can help you along the way with making some of that stuff act uh, a little better. 
Also, something else to think about, uh, this, is, this applies to arms and elevators, is counterbalancing. Um, you need to design your robot to be power efficient, like I mentioned before, and weights or negator springs are a very easy way, uh, or springs in general, are a very easy way to reduce the amount of mechanical load that your robot's motors need to apply to be able to move something. And that means you can use a lower power motor, a lower gear reduction, because of the fact that the weight or the negator spring is helping negate some of the work that you need to do to be able to move that system. We're almost reaching the end of our time here, so I'm gonna keep going a little quicker. I've already mentioned how feedback control for ARM. Yeah, I'm almost done actually. I'm pretty sure I'm really right here at the end. Like I said, feedback control is really important. Definitely make sure you can read the position of your arm or your elevator so that it's easier to control both autonomously and mechanically. And here's the last subsystem I wanted to talk about, and that's climbers. Climbers usually can be an extension of elevators and arms. Uh, they can use systems like pneumatics, lifts, um, rack and pinions or winches, which essentially are ropes and pulleys. Uh, to be able to lift your robot up. These systems usually have to be high torque, which means you need to use a higher gear ratio or higher powered mowers, motors and a lower gear ratio. It varies based on how you need to do it. But essentially, you're lifting up the entire weight of your robot for these types of challenges. And hint, hint, um, this coming challenge will have a lifting component to it. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to go about it. and uh, these are just some examples and things to think about uh, whenever you're designing a lift system. You want to make sure that it's robust. And lifting competition challenges are usually the highest value component of a game. So you want to make sure that your lift system is reliable and it works every time and you don't have it have any give you any random failures because the point values for the lifting part of a game are astronomical almost every year. Um, not that they're always worth it, but they're usually the most challenging, one of the most challenging parts, and they usually are proportionately uh, valued so. So with that, I'm going to leave you with the nutshell that almost any uh, mentor uh, who's been around the FRC competition space will leave you with. Learn from the best and invent the rest. Uh, I'm going to give you an example that uh, I most recently came across. Toyota's Formula One team has been competing for over 20 years. You know how many times Toyota's Formula One team has ever won? Because Toyota makes wonderful cars, right? They're, the, if you look at a like maintenance spec sheet of how much it costs to maintain a Toyota vehicle, it's the cheapest vehicle to maintain by far. They make excellent vehicles, quality wise. You know how many Formula One races Toyota's Formula One team has won? Zero. You want to know why? Because Toyota refuses to really hire anyone from the outside of Toyota to learn how the best practices work in Formula One so that they can improve upon themselves the, the winning strategies that exist. Take the time to take spend some time to research the winning practices that exist in FIRST so that you can implement them on your team. It'll be a great learning experience for you and it'll help you get to where you wanna go competition-wise. So definitely take that to heart and um, apply it any way you can. So I don't see any questions if there were any. Um, John, we don't have any questions in the Q&A. But we've got maybe time for one, maybe two, if they're quick. So if anybody has a question, now's the time to post them. Yeah. If you have anything, um, if you think of <laughs> later on, um, you can reach out to me. I'm in the Peachtree Discord. Um, uh, you can find me there. I'm on all the time. Um, or um, just reach out to me via email, uh, john.fogarty at aol.com. Uh, or just come to, uh, if you have a question or you need help at competitions, please come find me. I'm a really, really tall person in Team Morgan and Choose Pit. I, I would love to be every team's big brother, essentially. I want to help everyone compete to the best that they can. So uh, if you ever need any help, let me know. Okay, just a final reminder, this presentation, uh, the 
as we just saw it, will be posted on the first website sometime later in the part of this week. And with John's permission, we'll post the slideshow also. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to look at it again, uh, it'll be available. Uh, just go to the Georgia First website. There will be links up as soon as we get these things processed and, and up there. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank John for a very enjoyable presentation. I've been doing this 15, 16 years, and I still learned a few things. So uh, it was a, a good thing to enjoy, uh, to participate. Anybody else got anything? Nope, just a thank you. And I, we, that is appreciated. Uh, with that said, I'm going to call this session to an end. We can set up for the next one. John, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you.